Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster and today we will be covering the mystery surrounding Marc Jacobs being fired from Perry Ellis. This is the version of this story that gets passed around. Marc Jacobs presented Perry Ellis' Spring 93 show. He introduced grunge into fashion with this collection. He was fired because his ideas were too extreme. Mark dared to be different and he became a creative martyr. Okay, so there's a few things about this story that don't line up uh, at all with what the record actually shows. Let's dive in. This is the single most legendary runway presentation of Mark Jacobs' career. How legendary was this show? It makes regular appearances on listicles of top runway shows of all time, and Mark himself recently reissued a bunch of the pieces from it. Why is this collection relevant now? I mean, that's pretty easy. Fashion is obsessed with the 90s. We've all had our heads buried in the early 90s runway shows for the last 30 years. More broadly, fashion history is important. And for both those reasons, it's important that we understand all of the actual facts that surrounded this event. If you're anything like me, Perry Ellis was before your time. I'm 32 and I think of Perry Ellis as a Marshalls brand, honestly, but in the mid 80s, the man Perry Ellis was a dominant force in the world of fashion. We're gonna get a little bit of historic context first and then we're gonna jump into the mystery and a lot of misconceptions about this event. The late 70s. Perry Ellis, the man, started Perry Ellis International in 1978. It was pretty quickly successful on both the men's and the women's side, and he enjoyed great sales and great critical reception. He was doing excellently well. Perry understood what people wanted in their clothes, and he was able to consistently push them just outside of their comfort zone for him to stay cutting edge. Business was booming. Ellis's career was tragically short-lived. He died of AIDS-related complications at the age of 46. That was in 1986. The man only got to run his own brand for eight years, but during that very short period, he crushed it. So almost immediately after Ellis's death, sales at the brand started to plummet, especially on the women's wear side. So everyone's favorite cool kid at the time, Mark Jacobs, was brought in to help revitalize the women's wear side of the brand in 1988. Mark was only 25 years old when he was handed the keys. That is very, very young in the fashion world. So in total, Mark Jacobs was at Perry Ellis for four years. And leading up to that legendary Spring 93 collection, there was no real precedent in his work there that showed some kind of continuity to lead up to it. The rest of his work there was very 80s high fashion stuff. Spring 93 presented a huge shift in direction for Marc Jacobs. The fashion industry was late to the grunge look, but we're usually late to things. By the time this collection hit the runway, the default grunge album Nevermind by Nirvana was two years old, and their follow-up to Nevermind in utero had almost completed all of its writing. The fashion of the grunge scene itself, not the fashion industry, but just the clothes that the people in grunge were wearing, that was also very well established at this point. In a nutshell, the idea was that grunge bands would wear the same clothes on stage that they would wear if they were just hanging out at the house all day. Just like ratty thrift store clothes, a lot of layering for warmth because it was a scene that was born out of the Pacific Northwest. The idea there was that it was authentic to do that. It was a sharp contrast to the way that the punk movement had treated everything where everyone was kind of wearing these costumes on stage with pins and the crazy hair and the really aggressive clothing. There certainly were members of the punk movement that were wearing those clothes all the time, but it didn't seem like something that someone could wear all the time. And by the time of the early 90s, for those who were very plugged into the music world, punk was generally thought of as a very corporate thing at this point. So the idea was that these grunge bands would go on stage and just wear whatever the fuck and that was a way of signaling to the audience, this is all coming directly from me. There is nothing that's put on here. This is very authentic. Okay, are you ready for the first misconception about the Marc Jacobs Perry Ellis story? Oh shit. Oh, bloody nose check. Ugh. Hey, while I'm trying to get this to stop, you should join my Patreon. The biggest benefit of that is that you get to join the private Discord server. There's a ton of people in there who are super knowledgeable and you get tons of Patreon exclusive videos. I actually just released one about finding your place within the fashion world. Won't you please support really this really bloody good. nose man? Com slash Bliss Foster. The link is always in my descriptions. Go check it out. Okay. Okay, first misconception. What's really strange is that grunge wasn't being heralded by Marc Jacobs at Perry Ellis alone. There were a number of different designers that were on the same wavelength in the exact same season. Both Anna Sui and Christian Francis Roth had incredibly grungy looking shows and all three designers dropped the buzzword grunge in their post-show interviews. Christian Francis Roth even had this very performative grungy thing where he sat on the floor and played his guitar. Sitting on the floor, that's so lame. It's also worth noting that Anna Sui and Christian Francis Roth didn't have any precedent for grunge in their shows either. Everything leading up to Spring 93 was completely different. Again, very 80s high fashion stuff. 
all three designers seem to make the shift to grunge kind of out of nowhere. So contrary to the popular myth, Marc Jacobs did not introduce grunge alone. There were two other designers doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. It's just that as far as the, you know, the telling of history is concerned, Anna Sui and Christian Francis Roth have not enjoyed nearly as much success, and it's way easier to point to a single person as the founding point of a movement, and it's usually easiest to put that onto someone whose name has survived in much more limelight, like Marc Jacobs. Hey, so quick note, that's not an oversight that Marc Jacobs is responsible for. Marc Jacobs has never claimed to invent grunge fashion. This has been an oversight on the part of the fashion media, not Marc himself. But he didn't do it alone, folks. Are you ready to get into the show itself? Let's go. So yes, we see the opening of this show is pretty middle of the road grunge. Typically with runway shows, the opening look is meant to set the tone for the rest of the work that we'll be seeing. And if there's something that's going to seem unwearable in a runway show, it's most often going to be put in the first look or in the final look. The second look is usually meant to be the more wearable approach to the aesthetic. Okay, so this show does not conform to any of those conventions. To be honest, this entire show seems incredibly wearable. There's really not a single look here that strikes me as too out there to actually be worn to you know, a regular event or maybe just something where you're supposed to dress up kind of nice. So the wearability of itself is to Mark's credit because that is incredibly grunge. There wasn't ever supposed to be something in the grunge fashion movement that was meant to be like, oh my gosh, you would have to be like on stage performing in order to wear that. Like everything was supposed to be just, we are regular people wearing regular clothes, but we look cool. But as we move through here, I do want to point out that there's very little truly grunge stuff beyond a few references. Is that me downplaying Mark's work or influence at all? Absolutely not. But I do think there's a really important lesson here about how fashion takes on influences. So let's, let's keep moving. We see a few direct references to what is absolutely grunge that's mixed with what I would consider to be standard issue runway looks for 1993. He wasn't diving headlong into the grunge aesthetic. He was experimenting with it. Fashion tends to come late to these kinds of movements and we often struggle to fully dive in when we do start taking them on. That's not singling Mark out. It's just a thing that's true about fashion at large. The final looks are t-shirts with graphics from one of the most legendary American illustrators in history, Robert Crumb. Crumb is a really good pick for this theme. His life story and his work is a great visual representation of the grunge movement. So again, all of these looks are very wearable. The only thing I can think of that's possibly offensive about this is the styling. We have some slouchy beanies, I guess, and like in the first look when the model takes off her trench and lets the flannel drop over one shoulder, that is a very grunge thing. Everyone has very blown out eye makeup as well, which is also very grunge. But if fashion critics are going to criticize this as a collection of clothes, the styling and the makeup should be a piece of that, surely, but it shouldn't be the determinant for making them furious at this collection. But boy, did they get mad. Let me tell you. Fashion critics were furious at this collection. There were a lot of them that were very outspokenly mad. There is this hilarious quote from Isaac Mizrahi, who didn't mention Mark by name, but said, if it's so, if you've ever heard Isaac Mizrahi's voice, I can't do a good imitation of him, but you should picture it in Isaac Mizrahi's voice. <laughs> if it's so chic to look grungy, then why isn't it chic to eat rotten chicken? Now, excuse me, I am offended by people who look ugly. Offended! And some designers are jumping on this bandwagon trying to make people look ugly, and I think that is wrong. <laughs> I love Isaac Mizrahi. <laughs> His autobiography is also super good. It's one of the most unusual autobiographies that I've ever read. It's extremely stream of consciousness. It's very him. You should go check that out if you haven't before. And I'm guessing that the sensibilities of the fashion media at the time were just so geared towards fashion being otherworldly that this was offensive to them. From the perspective of fashion critics at the time, the grunge proposition spelled the end of fashion overall. Fashion needs to be a fantasy, especially in the hangover of the 80s, and especially for many critics who came up in the golden era of glamorous fashion, the 1970s. But grunge was proposing that you didn't need the fashion industry. Everything that you needed to be cool was available at your local charity shop. And it's understandable that the fashion industry felt threatened by this. Grunge was such a massive topic at that fashion week that the following month at Milan Fashion Week, Susie Minkes passed out these pins to fellow fashion journalists that said, grunge is ghastly. It's like the daintiest protest of all time. To her credit, Susie Minkes is one of the greatest fashion critics of all time. I look up to her a ton. She's since done retrospectives on that show and laughed at herself for overreacting in that way. She's a good sport. Mark did have a reason for incorporating grunge into the show. He wasn't just cashing in on a really popular music movement at the time. There's a really good quote that exemplifies this. Mark said, quote, 
Designers still make references to Katharine Hepburn, and they don't remember that there are photographs of Joan Crawford sitting in an Adrian bias cut gold lame dress, and next to her is Katharine Hepburn sitting in a pair of pants with socks and sandals, like the ugliest thing in the entire world. But we look back at that and say, didn't she have the most incredible style in the whole world? While all the other starlets were being glamorized, she had this kind of anti-chic, anti-glamour. And all of this grunge stuff is like that. And this mixture of high and low fashion is extremely common now. It's what most of us who are in this obsession of fashion live by when we're getting dressed in the morning. Mixing high fashion stuff with just Birkenstocks or whatever. And all things considered, this keeps the colors and the shapes of Perry Ellis in mind pretty well considering how extreme Mark's proposition is. I mean, for comparison, this is what Nirvana was wearing at the time. This is what Courtney Love was wearing at the time. This is what the guys from Pearl Jam were wearing. This is what the dudes from Alice in Chains were wearing. Grunge was substantially dirtier and much less considered than Mark Jacobs was doing on the runway. And I don't say that to diss Mark. I mean, clothes on a runway generally need to be clean. Clothes on a runway generally need to be new clothes. So now comes the part of this story that everyone loves to talk about. Mark was fired. He was actually fired so shortly after the presentation that there wasn't even time to produce the collection itself. It, it never got made. And uh, an interesting anecdote, Marc Jacobs sent samples from the original runway show to Courtney Love and Kurt Cobain. And when Women's Wear Daily asked them about it a couple of months later, they just casually said that they burned the clothes. So to wind that back, the original samples from one of the most legendary collections of all time that never got produced were burned. You gotta give them credit. That's some cold, badass shit. Okay, so this is where we get to the part of this story where a lot of things get very confusing. To be totally upfront with everyone, I didn't live through this. I was four years old while all this was taking place. All that I can do is go back and read all of the things that we have on record from official sources that are talking about it. That said, there are a few things about this story that don't line up at all to me. Most notably, I don't think Mark was fired because of this collection. To quote from the Times, two weeks ago, the giant 7th Avenue company, referring to Perry Ellis International, decided to stop producing the unprofitable women's collection that Mr. Jacobs had been designing for four years. Though he had delivered a much discussed and much photographed grunge-inspired collection for spring, the board of Perry Ellis International did not foresee ever making money on his women's wear. So this is just kind of one of the elements of this story that doesn't seem to line up. I don't think that Marc Jacobs was a creative martyr here. The brand brought him on to solve an unsolvable problem. Perry Ellis passed, the women's wear is tanking, we need women's wear to be profitable again. He wasn't fired because his collection was too daring. He was fired because the business model at Perry Ellis just wasn't working. And that wasn't Mark's fault. The head of Perry Ellis Sportswear even said on record that he doubted that Perry Ellis Predaporte could even turn a profit at all. Okay, and, and here, is, here is the weirdest part of this. I don't even think the word fired applies here. Because after all this happened, Mark went out and started his own brand. And again, to quote from the Times of March of that same year, the initial financing for Mark's brand is coming from his former employer, Perry Ellis International, which is going out of the manufacturing business to concentrate on the merchandising, marketing, and design of its licensed products. Mark wasn't fired. The president of Perry Ellis International, Claudia Thomas, said, quote, Part of our strategic plan was to get out of manufacturing and put more energy and creativity into licensing. It coincided with what Mark wanted to do. We had a strong relationship and a good partnership. Does that sound like someone who is getting fired to you? That sounds like someone who was brought into the office, explained that the company is shifting directions, but that they wish him well and that they're sending him off with funding for his own project. I will definitely admit that there are plenty of shady deals and lots of stuff that people don't end up talking to the press about, but that whatever things were happening behind closed doors, that's a pretty sweet deal for Mark, and I don't think that the word fired is a good word at all to use here. So as always, the truth of stories like this is way more interesting than some fanciful retelling that didn't actually happen. There's a lot to learn here about the way that the industry works and the way that aesthetics get introduced into runway collections. As always, friends, go join the mother Patreon. That's the only way that I'm able to do episodes like this. These take an enormous amount of research and writing time. I have editing to do. There's, there's a lot that goes into these. The Patreon is the only way that this channel is able to exist. Go follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I love you to the moon and at least halfway back.